I am standing knee deep in rain and mud digging deeper and deeper into an abominable act that I can't come back from. Beck has been my best friend for over 15 years, and he is one of few people I would drop everything for. Still, my inner voice is shouting that what we're doing is wrong. Beck is standing just a few feet from me, but I can't see him. Rain is coming down in torrential sheets, mud creeps back into this grave quicker than we can bail, the sky is overcast, and to make visibility worse, there is a thick fog blanketing the cemetery and our little town. It's like the universe is screaming, don't do this. I can't stop my shovel biting into the sludge, prying wedges of heavy loam, and casting it over my shoulder just to make room for more mud and rain. Beck's desperate movements tells me he is not ready to give up. Sonny was Beck's wife. She was the love of his life. They'd been together for 21 years and had many years ahead of them. She had been there in the early days and stuck by him through thick and thin. They'd been looking forward to traveling together. The onset and metastasis of her cancer must have been rapid, or they'd kept silent about it. One afternoon Beck called and said Sonny had a hospice nurse. Less than a month later, Sonny was gone. I should have known something was amiss because Beck was bizarrely calm about the whole thing. He'd simply order that Sonny not be embalmed and that she was to have a quick burial, the next morning in fact. There were no pomp or circumstance. The attendants were just Beck, my wife Vic, and me. Nothing was said then the coffin was lowered. As the groundskeeper started filling in the hole, Vic drags me out of earshot from Beck. Sonny didn't want to be buried, Vic protests. They were close friends, Vic and Sonny, but Beck was Sonny's husband. Maybe she changed her mind, I say. Vic nods but the knitting of her brows said Vic didn't think she had. I'll wait for you in the car. Take your time, Vic murmurs. She returns to Beck's side gives him a few words of condolence and a hug before heading toward the awaiting car. We stand in the cooling afternoon until the grave has been covered and a roll of fresh sod replaces the strip of dead grass where Sonny's grave lay. Can I ask you a favor? Beck asks me. Yeah, anything, I answer. Will you help me dig her up tonight? Beck asks. We had been friends, hunting and fishing partners and co-workers for well over a decade. There was little I wasn't willing to do for my best friend, but something in me shouted, say no, you're heading down a dark path, Miles. Bud, I, I think we'd be breaking a law or something, I reply. Beck scans the horizon letting a long uncomfortable silence pass between us. Then he fixes me with a pleading look, his head tilts to one side. If something happened to Vic, what would you do to have her back, he asks. I hang my head, shaking it more so at myself than Beck. Can I ask why we're doing this? I broach. There is a woman that lives in the woods across the street from me. A few months ago, one of my goats got out and was hit by a car. I watched her come out of the woods and pick it up. I followed her into the woods, and I saw her bring the goat back to life. Beck confides. What if the goat was just stunned? I suggest. Beck shakes his head vehemently. I know what dead looks like, Miles. She, she said something, waved a hand over it and, poof, the goat stood up. Beck, do you know how crazy this all sounds? He puts a hand on my shoulder and fixes me with a look of desperation and vulnerability I've never seen before. As crazy as it sounds, if you were in my shoes, wouldn't you at least try it? Beck asks. Vic's voice, or more like my inner voice taking on Vic's voice says, you're putting yourself between a rock and a hard place, Miles. Turn back now. But Beck has a point, if I were in his shoes, I'd do anything. The best case scenario, we dig her up, take her to this necromancer lady, nothing happens. We rebury her and no one is the wiser. Beck's shovel strikes gold, and he is re-energized. I too am shocked back to life at seeing the dark lacquered casket and my shovel cuts through rainwater-induced sludge. 
Beck drops his shovel then desperately sweeps across the glimmering top half of the casket. He breaks open the top half and fishes around in the cocoon of satin and darkness. I scramble out of the claustrophobia-inducing hole watching from above as Beck hefts the limp waxy figure of Sonny from the casket. I don't know if he knows I'm watching or if he doesn't care, Beck cradles Sonny in one arm and with his free hand smooths back her dark hair from her face. A thought crosses my mind, something doesn't feel right. Sonny had not been a large woman to begin with, by the time she died she weighed around 70 pounds. It takes Beck feeding Sonny up to me and me pulling with all my might to get her out of her grave. Beck hoists himself out of the grave and attempts to pick Sonny up cradled in his arms, but with our medical backgrounds, he should know better. Dead weight is different, heavier somehow, less cooperative. I see the light bulb go on in Beck's head and he tosses one of Sonny's arms over his right shoulder, balancing her weight carefully before standing with Sonny in a fireman's carry. We shuffle as quick as we can out of the cemetery. I am no stranger to death and yet I feel uneasy with a core in the bed of Beck's truck. It feels like time has slowed as we rush toward Beck Street. It's a paved two-lane country road with no lights. Pulling off it means unpaved dirt roads or even untrampled wilderness. Beck turns out the lights and we begin to creep for a mile or so, passing Beck's driveway and then creeping a litter further. The truck takes a right hand turn into a grazing pasture. Beck keeps us in the shadows of the trees, skirting along the outermost of the pasture for several long minutes. A small single wide trailer appears in the distance. It is lit up like the 4th of July. There must be a hundred candles burning. The nearly in sync flickering is hypnotic, light and shadow chasing each other from one side of the window to the other. Beck stops the truck inches from the only door into the trailer and out steps not an old gray crone but an ageless redhead. Beck exits the truck and hurries to the bed where I see him wrestling Sonny's core until he has her in a fireman's carry. I don't know if I should follow, if I should try to talk some sense into Beck, or, well I just don't know. I decide on joining him at the doorstep of the trailer. We step into the trailer and the redhead wordlessly shuts the door behind us. She has prepared an altar, a well-used picnic table surrounded by dozens if not hundreds of candles. She gestures for Beck to place Sonny on it and he does. She unveils with theatrical whimsy two wire kennels in the corner. Two frightened German shepherds cower in the back, heads hung low, eyes wide, and nervously tapping their paws on the plastic liner. They are Sonny and Beck's dogs. Beck, I hiss, taking hold of his left bicep. Beck steps forward and opens the first kennel. He plunges something into the first dog's neck as blood floods the kennel liner. He does the same to the second dog. The redhead steps forward and collects blood from both dogs then holds out the run-of-the-mill drinking glass to Beck. He wraps his fingers around the blade of the six-inch long knife I hadn't even been aware he had until that moment and he yanks the blade with his right hand, calling forth a thick continuous flow of blood. He squeezes his fist over the glass. In horror, all I can do is watch. The redhead dips a milky bony finger into the accumulation of blood and draws something on Sonny's forehead, each of her wrist, and atop each of her foot. Without a caps, Sonny's eyes hang slightly open, just enough to show the milky glaze over them. Vic, or rather my inner voice is screaming, get the hell out now. Go home, says the redhead. Beck and I do as she says. We jump back into Beck's truck and make our way back to his house. Beck doesn't invite me in and I'm relieved. All I want to do is go home and try to wash the stench of sinning against humanity off me. I cross the hood of my car and before I can step inside, Beck extends a hand to me. Thank you, Miles. You're a true friend, Beck says. He sniffles then averts his eyes. When, when Sonny comes home, maybe we can all go back to the way things were. I force a shaky smile and a single nod, and he returns the same. I sink into the cold seat and start up my car. I don't let it run before shifting gears and speeding away.
It's almost been two days and I haven't heard from Beck. I also can't get the stench of death and decay out of my hair and off my skin. I'm sure Vic can smell it too because she retreats to another room of the house every time I come near. I can't help but look over my shoulder constantly expecting the police to show up and arrest me. For some reason though, I feel as though something worse is in store for me than jail. Vic appears in the doorway between the kitchen and the living room. She looks as sickly as I feel. You should give Beck a call, check up on him, Vic suggests. I nod in agreement, but I'm not sure why I'm not moving. I'm worried about him, Vic adds. I can't look at her because she'll find out what we did. The phone rings once, twice, a third, and then a fourth time before it goes to voicemail. I can't think of anything to say so I hang up. I stand and Vic knows what I'm thinking. She is already putting on her winter boots. We get into my car and back out of our driveway. Nothing seems out of place at Beck's farm, nothing except the air. I knock and then we wait. A long moment later, Beck's wide eyes peek through a crack in the door. He opens the door the rest of the way and lets us in. She's back, Beck whispered excitedly. What? Vic asks. Now. Don't make any sudden movements. Keep your voices soft or you'll scare her. Vic, Miles, Sonny is back, he hisses. Vic stops in her tracks then hurries out the door leaving me with Beck. We step into the living room and there sitting in Beck's recliner is something that resembles Sonny. It looks like a wax figure, her skin almost gray, her dark hair matted and corded from all the rain and mud from the night we dug her up. She is wearing her cotton robe with her name embroidered on the left breast as if to remind her and us who she had been in life. I can't walk any further than the doorway. Beck goes to kneel beside the recliner but rests his hands a few inches shy of hers. Sonny, he murmurs. The waxy version of Sonny sits forward and my body freezes. She slowly turns her neck accompanied by crackling and it is the sound of her vertebrae readjusting. She, or rather it, is looking in my direction but I'm not sure it can see me. The cloudiness of her eyes has grown hazier and more opaque. Her cheeks are more sunken and her lips more parched and puckering revealing slivers of teeth. Beck looks up at me with pleading eyes. I am trying my best to hide the horror and fear of the thing. She can't talk yet. I think with time, she'll remember, Beck says. Beck, I breath but nothing further can be said besides the truth. I'll get her cleaned, Beck assures me. It lets out a wheezing sigh and from the corner of my eye I see the beginning of a stream of foam bubble out her nostrils and the corners of her mouth. Pink foam accompanied by a fishy wet smell. Beck daps at the discharge with his sleeve. I'll call you when Sonny gets to feeling better, Beck says, rising to usher me out. As I turn the way I came, I swear I can see a crack of a smile tug at the corners of its dried brittle lips. I am overcome with the sense that if I don't talk some sense into Beck right now, this could be the last time we talk. Beck ushers me onto the front porch. I feel relief wash over me but then dread overtakes everything. Beck, you can't keep her, you know that right? It's not. Beck? I hear it rasp and gargle. Down the short hallway I see it stumble, grasping onto the walls for support, toward us. Beck, I hiss as I pull his ear closer to me. We can put it back and no one will be the wiser. It's not sunny anymore. It hobbles its way directly behind Beck, reaching an ashen hand out to touch him. Its fingers are long, the skin so taut it might snap and crack at any moment. The nails show signs of cyanosis. It smells like death and putrefaction. As it takes hold of Beck's left bicep, I see a wave of horror wash over him which he quickly tamps down and waves me off, retreating back inside with it. Vic is shaking so much I'm not sure she should be driving, then again, I am probably far less dependable. The wide-eyed fear on Vic's face tells me she saw the thing. I'm calling the police, Miles. That thing is not good, Vic whispers. What are you going to tell them, Vic? No one is going to believe us. Besides, 
what is the police going to do? I reply. I, I don't know. I love Beck too and I want him to be happy, but Vic can't finish the thought. Let's give him time. If, if we don't hear from him by tomorrow, we'll call the police, I say. Vic shakes her head at me and herself for giving it more time. Vic shakes me awake. She hands me my phone. The name reads, Beck, but when I brought it to my ear, I hear, nothing. Beck? I call. Beck. Are you alright, man? Nothing. Beck, I'm calling the police, I tell him or whoever is on the other end. I hang up then dial 911. I'm wide awake pacing the length of the living room. It takes three rings for an operator to answer. Then, something catches my eye, Vic glued to the window facing the side yard. 911, how can I assist you, a voice answers. I too am drawn to the window now. The side yard gently slopes downward towards the detached garage, there is about three or four yards of lawn to cross. Standing under the floodlight mounted on the side of the garage is a small figure in a bathrobe. There is an intruder outside my house, I say. What is your address, sir? The small figure crosses the lawn with a stumbling uneven gait. As it nears Vic and I notice that the creature has something tucked under its right arm. 623, Poplar Circle, I answer. She's looking right at me. Sir. The creature stops short of touching the window. Its long black-tipped fingers take hold of its package under its arm and unfurls it. Vic lets out the most primal scream I've ever heard. Miles, can you do me a favor? The creature asks in Beck's voice. Miles, can you do me a favor? It is clearly Beck's voice and yet, wrong, like a tape recording replaying. I see what I think is a rubber suit inches from my nose. Those milky eyes stare unblinking into our living room, that voice that once belonged to Beck comes from the cracked mouth of that thing. Miles, can you help me? It sings in Beck's voice. Vic is writhing on the floor both her hands over her ears as that thing brings the rubber suit up to its mouth and takes a bite then begins to chew. I recognize the blonde stray hair sticking out from its mouth, Beck's hair. Beck, I'm hungry, the creature parrots Sonny's voice, distorted, lower in pitch and slower. What can I get you, the creature asked in Beck's voice. Then it lets out a howl of a scream, a prolonged scream of agony. Make it stop. Vic cries. All I can do is watch as the creature continues to eat the meat suit that had once been Beck. When Sunny comes home, she won't be exactly the same, the creature says in a soothingly husky woman's voice. I don't care. I'll take her back in any form than not have her at all, the creature says in a tearful Beck's voice. When the body comes back, the soul doesn't always return. It can be anyone or anything, the unfamiliar woman's voice sings. If you like and enjoy this content, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share with someone who might enjoy this too.